everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books podcast. My name is Ross McKeechee. And today I am very excited that we'll be in conversation with Stephen Jenkinson. Now, before I get into his formal introduction, I would like to acknowledge that although we have people joining from around the world, Banyan Books physical location is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Banyan Books and Sound is in its 50th anniversary year this year, and I encourage all of you to support your local independent bookstores. You can go to banyan.com, B-A-N-Y-E-N.com, or visit us in person seven days a week. Now, our guest today, Stephen Jenkinson is a spiritual activist, an author, ceremonialist, and farmer. He has master's degrees in theology from Harvard University and social work from the University of Toronto. Stephen is the subject of the National Film Board of Canada feature length documentary film titled Grief Walker. He teaches internationally and is the co-founder of the Orphan Wisdom School with his wife, Natalie Roy, in 2010. Orphan Wisdom is a teaching house for the skills of deep living and making human culture. Our honored guest is the author of several books, including the award-winning Die Wise, A Manifesto for Sanity and Soul, and Come of Age, The Case for Elderhood in a Time of Trouble. Apprenticed to a master storyteller when a young man, he worked extensively with dying people and their families. His former program director in a major Canadian hospital and former assistant professor in a prominent Canadian medical school. He's also a sculptor and traditional canoe builder. In 2015, he co-founded the Knights of Grief and Mystery Project with singer-songwriter Gregory Hoskins. Today, Stephen Jenkinson is here to speak with us about his brand new book titled, A Generation's Worth, Spirit Work While the Crisis Reigns. He has described this book himself as something of a plague document, dispatches from the front lines of a strange occupation undeclared. A Generation's Worth is illustrated with five etchings in the artist's edition set includes five original hand-pulled rubato prints in a limited edition of 100 sets signed by the author and artist. The soft cover of that book is available from Banyan, banyan.com. The audiobook, hardcover, soft cover, and artist editions are available at Stephen's website, which is www.orphanwisdom.com. I'll just share with you that I personally have had the privilege of being in Stephen's company on two occasions. Once was for one of Banyan's Die Wise events, and another was attending one of his nights of grief and mystery shows in Vancouver. And it's difficult to describe the mood that is woven at these occasions, but I will say this, you may want to cry, you may shift uncomfortably in your seat, you might hoot or holler. You might feel your heart break. And you might just leave feeling a little more human. Oh. Banyan community, please join me in welcoming Mr. Stephen Jenkinson. Stephen, it's thank not. you for being with us. Thank you, too. There's a very fine introduction, and I'll see if I can live up to it. Now, you start off this new book a generation's worth talking about how the process goes of wrestling with a title for a book. Why did you end up on this title, a generation's worth spirit work while the crisis reigns? Well, I, the subtitle I think is pretty self-explanatory or self-declaring, maybe I should say. Um, I'm, I'm as usual advocating being bossy and telling you what to do. I hope I'm leaving a little room for objection and you know naysaying, but I mean, why write a book and genuflect 
to the to the regime. I I I, I wouldn't see the reason for it really. So uh, spirit work, perhaps for the perhaps over the next hour, that I'll elaborate the, the term and my take on it. Uh, the crisis reigning. Well, this, of course, I'm referring to the plague, uh, which is ongoing, no matter what the advertising is telling us. You know, people are still dying of it every day. And God forbid we should start speaking about it in the past tense. But uh, because that's a pre prelude to amnesia. And uh, when when people start fantasizing about a restoration of 2019, you know you're in trouble, <laughs> as if as if the way it was a scant two years ago is something to live up to or to to hearken after or feel nostalgic about. Uh, so, but uh, the the title, well, uh, a generation's worth sort of picks up the tradition that I established with the last two books, where where the title shifts ongoingly between uh, two possibilities. In this case, um, <clears throat> I'm using the phrase a generation's worth <clears throat> as a kind of increment or unit of measurement or currency. So I'm saying, you know, and I didn't invent the term, obviously, the notion of a, of a, a day's worth or a, a year's worth or um, worth your salt, right? I, I picked up this, this nuance. And I simply imagined that a generation with all of its uh, flaming foibles and futilities and fame st stands in for a kind of psychic currency evaluation, if you will. It's a, it's a unit that we can sort of look at as a distinct thing that exists in space and time and wonder about it. And, and not feel that the ends, that, that the limits are so flabby that we're forever universalizing and generalizing. So that's one aspect of it. But the other aspect is that I was frankly calling out my generation. And it's that, that gesture is there throughout the book. And there's no doubt. Calling out meaning this, I'm wondering whether, what is my generation's worth? What shall, what shall the book say? What shall the young people say, the ones that are not born yet, as, they, um, as they're obliged to negotiate and bear uh, what, we've what we're in the process of bequeathing to them now? So, so it's foreboding, isn't it? That's, there's a sense of, of, um, that all is not well uh, in central command or out in the provinces either. And I, as usual, tried to bear faithful witness to the, to the calamitous um, unwillingness seemingly to know things for what they are and to bear faithful witness to the understanding that, you know, the road sign used to say, I used to talk about it in the Knights of Grief and Mystery show. Uh, I used to refer to it as an oracle in the form of a road sign that said, be prepared to stop. Now, this was, I mean, we released a record that has this term and this, this kind of nuance in it a, sh a short, uh, I don't know, 12 months ago from right now. And already, I think the utility of me pointing that out has been eclipsed. And so I would say that the, line, the sign has changed subtly, but probably permanently. And now it's be prepared to be stopped. And we'll see if preparations are underway to voluntarily surrender. But I suspect that some force majeure is in the offing instead. I just want to let everybody who's here in our live audience know that we're going to be getting to many of your questions. Mr. Jenkinson is going to address as many questions as possible. So please go to the Q&A tab on your Zoom screen there and start putting in your questions so we can get to those in a little bit here. You just, you just pointed to 
um, some of the things that we might be being asked to examine in these, what you call plague times, this pandemic times. And one of those, as you point to in the book, is our unfettered ability to, to freely move and travel about mm -hmm. uh, not just the world, but maybe even our own country. Can you comment on that? Well, uh, it visited me personally. I had a 70 city, four continent tour lined up for all of 2020 with, uh, with the band, uh, none of which came to pass. Of course, I'm not alone in that. Most people's immediate lives uh, were in for a radical adjustment. That's true. But I'm not sure that the, the freedom that enabled me to do what I did should be restored simply because I miss it or simply because they have a vaccine. After all, globalization is as much the plague as COVID-19 is. I mean, I'm just going out on a limb and declaring that by the power vested in me by absolutely nobody at all. I declare that it's globalization is, is how, of course, of how COVID-19 vectored across the world, right? And the compromise of local custom, local limitations, local um, ability to self-determine. I mean, all of these things are bordering on things of the past already. So, uh, so although I was the beneficiary in a very um, sort of self-absorbed way of, of the ability to travel, it wasn't quite unfettered, but in hindsight, it certainly looks that way. But I think the fetters have their use. And I think um, if the clampdown uh, endures in some fashion or other, the, if we're granted temporary travel asylum, and actually get to go somewhere else, we might hold the opportunity in some remarkable esteem mm -hmm. in a way that having grown accustomed to it virtually prevents us from, from it and, and, and regards it as a basic human right instead. You're familiar with the, the comedy bit by uh, Louis C.K. about being in, a, in first class and the guy beside him is bitching about the fact, you know the one I'm talking about? Yes, I do. That is, that is uh, much vaunted, uh, new cell phone doesn't work up then. And you know, Louis CK says, it's got to go to space, give it a minute, he says. <laughs> so I mean, that points it out very well. And then COVID-19 has finished the job. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you mean, there's, you say in the book, at these in these times, if you're lucky, you'll be in a crisis right now. Right, right. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I, I, I forgot where that was in the book or I would have read it out loud myself. <laughs> um, here's what I think I meant on the day that I wrote it down. I was ruminating on the, etym as I often do, on the etymology of words. I find the etymologies themselves are kind of primordial origin stories that um, whisper much more than they declare. And there's so much to be had from learning the origin story of words that we take for granted. And of course, the word crisis has been used ongoingly for 20 months now to the point where you can't hear the word. It just means now it means something that's inconvenient and something you don't like or something that's not working out for you becomes a crisis. And of course, trauma is big business now, is it not? And just wait. If you think it's big business this year, wait till next year. So in actual fact, crisis in and of itself carries no pejorative connotation in its old understanding. The, the word crisis simply meant, I'm going to paraphrase it. The gist of it is, okay, once upon a time, there were more choices then was a good idea, let's say. There are more possibilities, uh, many of them of the fantasy variety. And uh, through circumstances that you both command and fail to command, these choices have been winnowed down severely. You don't welcome the winnowing at first blush 
but you might reconsider the blessing that's buried inside it because now the choices have become clearer, not simpler in the sense of um, easier to make, but simply a lot of the, a lot of the packaging is gone. And so a crisis is the opportunity to formally choose and then to commence the adult work of living with your choice, of fessing up to it and living with it and ceasing to live by default. And that's why I said, if you're lucky and if you work very hard, I think that line's in there, you will have, you will be in a crisis. Yeah, it's, it's simply very explicitly, it means something like where two contending tendencies meet but it doesn't say anything about that, that this is in and of itself uh, bad news. The contention, after all, is a condition of human life, spiritually and as well as politically. And it's where we exercise ourselves and find out what we're made of and what we're, what we're capable of, right? And the more the world agrees with you or resembles you, the flabbier you get. You, you mentioned that, um, you know, a generation's worth, you're, you're calling out your generation. And a moment ago, you mentioned, you know, being adult enough. One of the things you talk about in the book is um, that some governments you suspect might be not giving the whole picture to their constituents because they doubt whether people are, have the capacity to walk the adult walk. Right. Can you unpack that a bit for us? You know, um, I don't know if you know where it is. Are you in Vancouver right now? I'm uh, in Gibsons on the Sunshine Coast. Okay. So it may be too small a locale for what I'm about to describe. But most cities in North America of the older variety have this kind of cranky old building downtown that probably doesn't get much consideration. It's, co it's typically an old armory. Right. I've seen it many times going in and out of Victoria, for example. Yeah. And um, the reason I'm pointing it out is the advent of a, of a uh, sorry, what did I just call it? Armory. Armory. Armory downtown is a sure sign that the government doesn't trust the mob. You see, <laughs> it doesn't mind being elected by the mob, but that's where the affection ends. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're there for. And by the same token, uh, they don't establish armories so much anymore in the visible sense. The armories now are in the form of controlled and curtailed information streams, customized information streams, things of that kind. They're the armories now, and they're a sure sign that the, that the people in charge, and all, all of which are government people, very few of whom are elected officials, but those people who are covertly in charge have decided about our capacities based on our viewing habits and our anxieties and our buying habits. And those things faithlessly report, or I should say ruthlessly report on our limitations when it comes to taking upon ourselves the adult work of deciding otherwise when there's enough evidence that it's enough already, right? So I'm not inventing anything here, but I'm categorizing it, certainly. And, and so when it comes to the news about the plague, you, you can feel it. You can feel, for example, so they open the border one way, they close it the other way, the Canada-US border. So what's going on there? Oh, they have double speak to describe why, but the principal reason why is that they're doing the balancing act between public health and economic health and they are willing to compromise to a certain degree public health for the sake of economic health. And there's no question that that's what's going on, right? If it was public health that was first and foremost, what are you doing letting people come in from a country that has questionable practices for the last 20 months when it comes to the plague? Okay, so alas, 
we have to establish a kind of republic of conscience as citizens, first and foremost, and radicalize our understanding of what the responsibilities of citizenship actually are, in my estimation. And this is, I mean, this is rabble rousing language. I'm well aware of it. And I'm really appealing to a kind of direct action when it comes to these matters. And allow me to read something to you that I came across when I was preparing myself for this. And if you want to follow along uh, where you are or at home, it's on page uh, 26 in a little section called Going. The latest on the plague is that we haven't seen much yet. There are mutant strains now. I wrote this at the end of January, by the way, I should say. There are mutant strains now, and they're resetting the clock on vaccination and on the constraints on your comings and goings and whereabouts. It's not clear that they're resetting people's ordinary expectation about their ordinary lives, though. There's something about normal. It's full of complaint and griping and the rest, often on a daily basis, but it remains the life goal of just about anyone in a crisis. Isn't that astounding? I mean, I'm, I'm admiring the sentence. As, as crazy as it is, it's a craziness that has some use when it comes into focus. When this is over, is a common expectation, a common metric of coping and hoping. When we get on the other side of all this is another, and when things get back to normal, and so on. So there's a clear and present understanding in the population, it's safe to say, that sees the plague as a temporary intruder, a kind of delinquent who's tipping the garbage cans in the back alley of normal life, a disorderly type. So let me skip a little bit and I'll finish the part by saying, would that the ultimate limit, the big one, death, makes the case for how urgently we must awaken and how mandatory is our defeat in the matter of living ever longer. But death has no more power to persuade the living than does crabgrass in the lawn or a headache on the one day off. Think of the mania among the bereaved for reacquiring their life, of the professional advice that amounts to closure and move on, when what their normal life included and often depended upon is in the ground or up in smoke and is not coming back. And then think of the particular anguish that comes with getting something of your normal life back how anticlimactic it all is, what a sight, excuse me, what a slight it is on what was and who was, and how the metric of adjustment to loss nets out as something between wretched amnesia and a kind of unfaithfulness. Well, that's how these last months might be remembered, if they're remembered at all, as a kind of shallow dive into the backyard waiting pool of coping with powerlessness and coping with change. But this is not change. This is loss and lostness at once. What is called for is a deep dive into the sudden goneness of ways of life that lingered far too long and that were on life support for far too long. Prolonged life support is suspended animation, to cling to them, to resurrect them once the all clear horn blows is not adjusting or coping, it's necrophilia. What's needed is necromancy, divining, soothsaying, learning what the endings would have us know and living in their wake. That's the working person's understanding of a wake and its grief that enables all of that. In other words, I'm suggesting that grief is citizens' work now. Thank you. I'll see you on the barricades. <laughs> We've got some questions rolling in from our audience. Are you ready to, to hear? I don't know if I'm ready, but I'm willing. <laughs> all right, all right. 
So the first one is from Jacob, not our amazing podcast producer, Jacob, but another amazing Jacob, another amazing Jacob, right? Who says, Hey, Stephen, I'm a young person who has spent a lot of time researching death, believing mortality sentience enables me to live with a more solemn vitality. Still, I don't want to confine you to being, quote unquote, the death guy. Death guy. (laughs) He says, since we're focused on a generation's worth and the opportunity of crisis, I find this question relevant. Stephen, as someone who has witnessed death, absorbed grief, and understands our cultural attitudes, what kind of action do you want to see young people undertake to redirect our culture? Well, I mean, it's an, it's a question that induces, invites me to a kind of uh, solemn certainty that I don't frankly possess and don't feel any particular obligation to possess either. So I would actually probably answer this in terms of elderhood rather than in terms of sort of death literacy, even though I'm, I'm big on death literacy or death wisdom. But um, the principal power, uh, it's an often awfully misused word, but I'm going to use it. The principal power that young people have is not their optimism, not their inclination to a kind of formless hopefulness, not the kind of functioning naivete that allows them to get up in the morning when the near future would suggest maybe that's not so wise or or necessary. Um, The principal power that young people have instead of all that malarkey is the willingness, despite all the evidence to the contrary, to undertake a search for a, a for real older person. Not somebody they like, not somebody who affirms them categorically, not somebody who loves them for what they are, none of that malarkey either. I'm talking about elderhood here, and the principal attribute of elderhood is that it's not in the approval business. It's in the testifying business, right? So the amazing thing is, though, in a time where the continuity of the elder function is in such wretched disrepair that it's all but non-existent among us now, that we're actually having to imagine what elders are rather than report faithfully from our witnessing on the matter. And this is not new in your generation or in mine. This uh, rupture of the elder function and its continuity has been going on to the point now where I would say, as a generalization, that in the dominant culture of North America, there is no living or lived memory of the presence and ongoing consequence of elders. Okay, it's not being remembered anymore. There's nothing to remember. It's too long ago. So we're having to imagine and give up at the same time. So elder, young people's willingness to seek out elders is the fundamental summons to the aged. Now, whether the aged see it that way is, you know, it's another question and uh, more time to give to it. But I, I will say that it's very unlikely that a bunch of older people together self-designating each other as elders produces elderhood. It, it's more like the activity room in an old folks home. That's what that describes. And what I'm talking about is that older people are called upon by the young to undertake impossible redemptive work, work that they themselves did not undertake in their peak income generating years. See, and now they've come to, you know, bordering on the third and last chapter of their life. And here are young people, perhaps in droves, although not at the moment, but perhaps that'll that'll come, who who are pleading with older people to come out from under their agedness and occupy the elder function, the faithful witnessing function, so that the kids stop being lied to and start being leveled with. And the way that begins, among others, 
is the, the final dispelling of the notion of hope. As I said in one of the records that we made last year, Gregory and I, um, if you want the kids to vote for you, you can tell them it's not too late, but you can't do that if you respect them. And if, frankly, it's too late for a lot of things. And, you know, I just read a seven page letter from a young woman this morning out on the West Coast who'd lived through the fires and a few other things. And she basically glimpsed something of the end times and she's not overwrought, uh, or if she is, that's not overwroughtness speaking. That's the willingness to see things uh, deeply unpromisingly. And that's the beginning of occupying your fundamental responsibilities at a, as a citizen in a troubled time is to enough already with the helium of what could be and start instead inhabiting the deeply unwelcome inheritance that's coming down the pipe. Thank you. You bet. There's a question from Leah who says, doomsday seems imminent. Yeah. It is so hard to live with such awareness. How to keep positive moment to moment when all seems so bleak and seems any positive act is now useless. That's okay. It. Who said you have to be positive? Where did the recipe for positiveness as the final make or break psychic orientation to life. Where'd that come from? Okay, so this is actually my point, that positiveness is, is radically overrated as, a, as an enabler. What it does is enables truancy, positiveness does. I saw this in the death trade virtually every day, where dying people in the name of dying well banished from their bedside anyone who was not positive. And do you know how positive translated itself in that moment? These people refused to be treated as if they were dying people. So the fundamental reality that drew most people to their deathbed, to the deathbed of the dying person, was the first casualty of being there and of being allowed to be there. So this is being co-opted, is it not? It's being fundamentally compromised, right? And that's what positivity fundamentally does to us, I think. So we have a responsibility now to forego positivity, uh, not curse it, simply turn it out to pasture because it's, it's tired. You know, it's, it's a kind of glandular reliance that the culture has, has mandated generation after generation. And... It has no place in a time like this. I, the last thing I'd say here, I feel like I'm talking so fast because uh, I'm trying to get so much in, no, uh, because of my sense of urgency about these matters, no? I have no despair, but I have urgency more than I can bear, frankly. And it's the difference between doomsday and domesday. And oftentimes it's misread as a doomsday book, okay? But the doomsday book is an actual thing that you can buy in the old Penguin Classic series about this big, and you'll never read the whole thing. But what it was, was following the Battle of Hastings in 1066, the Norman, people are going to go to sleep on me now, but just bear with me for a sec. And the Normans conquered England. The real conquering didn't happen then. It happened in the two or three years later. They were the Taliban of their time, the Normans were for the English. And they fanned out across the countryside in twos and threes with great ledger books of vellum. And here's what they did. Oh, Natalie just produced it. Decide, there it is. I've got a copy. The Domesday book. Look, it's crazy, no? You'd never do it to yourself. And it's onion skin paper to boot. Can you imagine how much is in there? So here's, what, here's what it is. These guys, like, um, like actuarials from an insurance company, they came to your little farm, your little hovel, 
and they measured and counted everything. I mean, literally everything. And this became the basis of the taxation system that sustained the Norman ruling class then and now. And I'm suggesting to you that at the level of a kind of civic psyche, there's something fundamentally traumatizing about having your material life and your psychic life subjected to numeracy and accountancy. And this is precisely what's happened to us now in the form of metrics and uh, Google mapping and Google Earth and Google and Amazon and all of that. We've been subjected to a level of scrutiny that nobody should be able to bear, frankly. Right? And then it's sold back to us as information. Now, people were at this point are saying, and you're going on and on. Well, there's a lot to say. But this is the difference between doomsday, which is just like the final collapse, like the big one, and domesday, which has really happened in human history, which we, anyone speaking this language that I'm speaking to you now, we are heirs to this collective trauma of being enumerated, oh. right? of being counted. And the amazing thing is, everybody, nobody wants to be left out right? of, of the big count. But what the psychic consequence of having your entire life enumerated and then being taxed accordingly is not just a financial reckoning, it's a psychic reckoning. So one of the acts of revolution would be to fail to be enumerated. Thank you. We have a question now from Karen. Karen says, I am wondering if you have thought much about the power and purpose of vaccines, quote unquote, what they are meant to do and not do to trigger an immune response, to protect, to kill something that kills. Vaccines familiarize your immune system, which makes antibodies to defend your body against harmful invaders. With a certain pathogen, so that it will know what to do if you become infected with that pathogen in the future, and how polarizing that function is turning out to be. So she's asking, have you thought much about it? Yeah, well, she's thought about it more than I have clearly and is clearer on some of the basic science about the matter than I feel the need to be myself. But we could wonder slightly askew from that orientation as follows. How has it come to pass that of all things, the vaccine is more politicized by far than how we got here in the first place? That is, people are more willing, apparently, to take sides on this matter and to demonize the other side than they are on the matter of how things have come to be as they are, right? Why? Well, for one reason, being vaccine, vaccinated is a discrete event. And so you can, you can weigh in on the thing because the, let's say, the long-term consequences at the moment are not with us. But the consequences I'm really thinking about are the divisive posturing that has accrued to this question of vaccine or no vaccine. And whatever the principles that people are appealing to, to cling to their position desperately and vehemently and venomously, I will bet that not many have entered into a deep relentless and faithful calculation of the consequences of inhabiting their position to the exclusion of the opposite position. Because that's a vaccine too. That level of certainty, unsupported by long-term experience with this vaccine, is its own vaccination, isn't it? with its own outcomes and its own uncharted and unanticipated consequences. And I, I frankly fear for a culture that's willing to take up positions this savagely 
in the name of being right without without apparently a willingness to consider the real possibility that you will have to live with the person whose decision you have gutted in some fashion and and that attempt will be undermined profoundly by your own certainty on the matter finally i'd like to imagine that it's one of the core conditions of an ongoing cultural life that while we be you know as a culture we are willing to abide by a handful of truisms that we proclaim and hold dear i wonder if the if adamance has to be one of them and i'd like to imagine uh, an enormous recall of this of these positions and stances uh, based on the fact that they've been proven to be faulty and they don't work and you know a level of general forgiveness and amnesty could ensue whereby the vehemence was understood in with hindsight to be a consequence of inexperience with genuine adversity as north americans if i may say compared to other populations in the world don't have a lot of time in with serious on the ground present danger adversity and i think in some way we bizarrely envy those cultures who do have that and our form of envy has been to elevate the question of vaccination to be some kind of moral order uh make it or break it moment among us i think it's the elevation of the vaccine issue that's becoming a make or break thing and we'll find out what we really believe about each other soon enough more than we'll find out what we believe about any vaccine thank you mm -hmm. ariel has a question okay. ariel says would you speak on the phenomena of mass hysteria <laughs> and the wildfire spread of conspiracy thinking we seem to be seeing around the world it is it's i can tell you from some personal experience it's exceedingly difficult bordering on anguishing and painful to be an outlier for very long but enough outliers have something to join and their outlier status is now gone without a trace see so it's it's not overly shocking to see that vehemence is a kind of religion right and it it's not overly surprising to me that um okay i'll begin differently I've heard it said and I'm going with it that autobiography begins with the feeling that you are alone. Well, your generation principally has invented autobiography or personal truth as the ongoing religion that replaced all the old outdated outmoded religions. It is it is if you will not one of the organized religion it is a disorganized religion but no less a religion with no less vehement adherence you know lining up to join and the more tradition is broken down in terms of personal views on tradition we ought not to be surprised that a kind of ideological strong man takes its place i don't mean a literal political figure here so much as the the notion that as they used to say strong opinions weakly held becomes a kind of religion unto itself and when you are you know this this ghastly machine that we're obliged to go back and forth on right now and all the circuitry and all the carbon and silicon that's involved in all that thing 
pay, plays a not insignificant part in what the questioner is asking about. Yeah, because you rely upon this as a legitimate alternative to the former big three radio stations or the former big five television stations, right? And the idea was that as soon as the, the edifice is dismantled, then everybody gets to decide for themselves. And so it's not an experiment anymore. That's what's been happening. And it's certainly been happening during the course of the pandemic. So I simply wonder aloud on behalf of everybody tuning in, how's it working when fearful people get to decide for themselves what's true? And the PS I'd offer on the matter comes from my time in the death trade. I was asked routinely, and I still am, um, how do I feel about euthanasia? And I would say, you know, you're asking me about pro or con. And my answer is, it doesn't matter whether I'm pro or con euthan. It doesn't even matter to me. But here's what matters apropos of the, of the thing. Its advocates will cling to euthanasia as proof positive that the culture is becoming willing to become more human and humane, demonstrably more humane you know, in the form of ameliorating people's suffering before it gets to the point of unendurable. And here's what I wonder on behalf of us all. The culture is fundamentally death phobic. I don't think this is negotiable. I think this is demonstrable. And a death phobic culture, Canada, has legalized euthanasia, although the people don't like the word euthanasia any longer, but whatever term you'd like to, the, the fact remains that a death phobic culture has legalized the practice. What does it tell you? It tells you that the practice does not challenge the death phobia, that the death phobia is intact on the other side of the ad adaptation to legalizing this practice, which is to say it's become death phobic friendly. That's how it works. So for every radicalized um, extreme, maybe that's not the right word, for every radicalized position taken up, look around its periphery and wonder, if you will, just what kind of a change you're willing to attribute to it. What kind of a change is being achieved? And as the questioner, I think, suspects, or probably knows, uh, the notion of conspiracy is no less a conspiracy than the conspiracies it's concerned with. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, bit of a conversation <laughs> killer, right? <laughs> Take a breath, everybody. We have a question from Patty, who says, if we don't have hope, what do we have? Will hopelessness not lead to despair, passivity, and recklessness? Well, hopefulness is leading to all those things. This is not a matter of conjecture. We don't have to wait and see what hope does. But of course, hope's advocates will assume the position that the question is hinting at, that without hope, it's a downward spiral. And all I would say is, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the downward spiral has accelerated during hope's regime. Does that cause you to pause at all and wonder what the consequence of hope genuinely is beyond the way that hope is sold. See, hopelessness is not the opposite of hope. Hope free is the opposite of hope. And you're listening to somebody who has crafted some ability in this area. Now, think what you will, approve of me or, or otherwise, but you're unlikely to find me depressive on these matters. Why? Because I am functioning free of hope, not permanently, 
I have my dark moments where hope comes creeping in and whispers to me about how it all could be <laughs> and will never be, right? And holds me ransom, doesn't it? Because the only legitimate time now is the time that's not now, which is what hope trades in. Hope trades in the future. I'm a citizen of the present. I feel no obligation to be hopeful about the present. I do feel an obligation to be alert and to be informed by a sense of urgency. And to us not to appear overly adamant, I would just say, I will leave the problems of hope to others, but secretly whisper that the, I think the, the results are in when it comes to being hopeful. So we've managed a healthy degree of despair and, and disconsolateness and uh, uh, nihilism and so on, while hope is, is in full effect, parading down Main Street every day. So I don't need to be persuaded any further than that. I saw what being hopeful did to people who were dying and basically it prevented them from dying because they, were, they couldn't be uh, found in the same place being hopeful and being a dying person. So this is a terrible apartheid. It's utterly unnecessary. And in certain circles, borders on criminal activity. In my, in my experience, what I saw, it was, it was a kind of malpractice that's never been talked about. Denise has a question. She says, be prepared to stop and surrender. On that road or in that road, not having children is valid, question mark? Ah. As for me, it is. For, for her, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Understandably so. And this is, a, this is a doozy. It's a very small question. But the scale of the consequence and the import is considerable. And I would just guess that this person is probably on the younger side of life than the older side of life. I don't know, obviously. The reason I say that is because I would say with some frequency over the last decade, increasingly younger people have sought me out and sought my opinion, which I never give, as to whether or not they should have kids. And secondarily, whether they should wed, but principally whether they should have kids. And what animates the question, it's not really a question, is it? It's a kind of um, primordial fret that to do so would be to contribute uh, in a criminal way to the cumulative um, grief debt that humans are racking up across the countryside. Well, I can't disagree that that, that would be one of the things that you were doing, whether you meant to or not. The truth of the matter is that the world does not need your imaginary child. I mean, even though you want to fantasize about your imaginary child could be the next Nelson Mandela and all of that. But the world doesn't need another Nelson Mandela. It's not clear that it needed the Mandela, Mandela that it got in terms of its willingness to attend to Mandela's presence. You see what I'm saying? So, so, so what else? Are you at least trying to do no harm and, and therefore... Uh, you refuse to procreate. It's a noble orientation with some ignoble consequences further down the line. And let's just be real about it and say that your moral orientation about contributing to the population problems and so on uh, will have consequences when you're in your 50s and 60s that you do not anticipate. And whether you craft the ability to be a, a grandparent and a godparent minus the, the biological continuum that grants you, quote, the right to do that or to claim people in that regard remains to be seen, no? 
because refusing to procreate will not necessarily humanize our corner of the world or orient us in a, in a more sustaining and sustainable fashion, right? Is it direct action? Obviously it is. Does it have a revolutionary possibility attached to it? Maybe, maybe. I'm not sure that not adding to the gene pool, I'll, I'll say it differently. If that's the decision to make, please consider deeply the possibility that refusing to contribute to the gene pool will not introduce the course correction that you might have been counting on as a recompense for the empty room at the end of the hall. Just give that one a moment. See, it's an adult question, right? It's, and it deserves an adult answer. And adults' answers are full of ambivalence, full of mystery, mostly of the unwelcome variety, right? Full of consequence, unintended mostly. And, you know, finally, this is what the word awake actually means etymologically. It doesn't mean you know, alert the opposite of asleep and, you know, psychically enhanced. The word awake explicitly means to participate knowingly in the web of consequence that emanates from everything you do and everything you don't do and everything you say and everything you don't say times as many people that pass through your life and you through theirs. It's an absolutely bewildering array of consequence that you sign up for as a result of willing to be, being willing to be awake. And I answered the question in those terms. And I virtually, there's virtually no comfort in the answer. I acknowledge that. Uh, it's, as, it's a respectful answer nonetheless, perhaps more respectful than if I had said, you know, I think as long as you do what you believe in, at the end of the day, you will find yourself restored and living a full, yeah, and all that. There's downside to the decision just as surely as there is upside to it. Thank you. You bet. Wendy asks, what is the role of massive complexity in the downfall of a global civilization? <laughs> and is there an antidote that is possible? How do we develop the capacity to meet the grief? Do I look like Noam Chomsky over here? <laughs> Take it easy, man. I'm just, you know, I went to Harvard, but I, I just barely made it through. You know, it's nothing, nothing. To, I mean, that's, that's, you got to pay for answers like that, those kind of questions. <laughs> this is a freebie. No, 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 I'm just joking. Um, but here's the thing. I feel no obligation to have macro solutions, you know, genuinely. And I'm not saying this in a clever way. I genuinely would, would counsel as follows. Our circumstance today is a complex one. That's true. Does this require complicating thinking to attend to them faithfully? I'm not sure that that's true. Notice I said complicating thinking, not complicated thinking. Yeah. You have no obligation to be... Okay, let me take one more run at it. Could you give me the, the gist of the question one more time, please? She says... What is the role of massive complexity in the downfall of a global civilization? And is there an antidote that is possible? The role of massive complex complexity. Right. Of course, in the question, there's not a lot of articulation about, you know, what form at what level she's wondering about it and so forth. But I would say this, um, at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, our solitariness 
is our arena. Now, I'm not prescribing that everything collapses down into what works for me. But I'm, 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 I, I suppose I'm invoking the old kind of 60s adage that you think globally and you act locally. The truth of the matter is all your actions are local, right? Okay, maybe this will help. No, it won't help. Maybe this will contribute what I'm about to say. It's gonna seem at first like it's a, a red herring, but I don't think it is. It's a blue herring instead. So we have a word in English language, human, and we don't debate it too much. And there's much to be wondered about about the fact that the word human gets a pass every time it's used. Well, not, not in the Orphan Wisdom School, but generally speaking, it does. When the word is used, it's either, when we use it, say, merely human or only human, trying to get off the meat hook for some consequence that we perpetrated or whatever, or uh, we, we're we trade in the gen generic Western humanist tradition, which is, Everybody is unerringly human, born human, dies human, and nothing can interrupt the continuity of your humanness. And this is deemed to be a great leap forward psychologically and psychically and the rest. And if that's true, I wonder why the English language has granted us a different word by adding an E on the end of the word human. Because surely the humanist tradition that uses the word humane is inadvertently confessing something that it wishes weren't so. And it's probably this. Humans, though their humanity might be their enduring personal possession, which they cannot cross or lose or diminish or dim, are capable of behaving in ways that seriously call into question what human even means. Is it even there? Does it even bear, you know, moderate scrutiny? The word humane is an unwitting confession of the humanist West. It's a kind of longing or a, a wish list. And it says, you know, on our best days, humans act humanely. And the rest of the days, it's not even a question. So that sounds complicated, but it comes down to, you know, the, the, the famous prayer with which one could begin one's day fruitfully. It goes like this, Lord, or whoever you pray to, so far, I have offended no one. I've called into disrepute, not, nor myself, nor anyone around me. I've not told any lies, no exaggerations. I've neither joined a conspiracy nor damned or cursed one, uh, nothing in between. However, I'm about to get out of bed and I'm gonna need all the help I can get from here on out to come to the end of the day breaking even. <laughs> I, got a, I got a that one. There's a question from Sabina who asks, in what way do you think that mainstream education can address many of the topics you've covered in your talk, including spiritual education, alertness, or consciousness training? It's, it's not likely, Sabina, uh, sadly, but truly. Uh, consider where the money comes from and understand that uh, gen generally speaking, generally speaking, a, fed, uh, a excuse me, a publicly funded education system is an indoctrination system first and foremost. It's not going to fund cells of disorder where the funding source itself is called into serious disrepute during the course of the educational process. It's just not going to, don't be, don't be naive and think that it should. Why should it? You know, why should we ask it to do everything for us, right? Uh, at the moment, education is deemed preparatory to employment until you consult the etymology of the word educate. Educo 
is Latin for to lead out. It's the very opposite of indoctrination. So deep education or, well, if I say radical education, it's actually um, repetitive because that's what education is supposed to be, yeah. right? It's, it, it, it's principal responsibility as education is to see to it that the current regime submits itself to the scrutiny of the education it's promising to deliver to its citizens. Now that would be an extraordinary leap forward, right? But don't hold your breath for it because this is not that regime. Okay, so then, then what? Answer is get your education elsewhere. See, I'm a product of the education of the publicly funded educational system. Now you may think that's damning of the system or you may think, well, if he can do it, you know, and what did I do among other things? I decided I'm going to have a school. I was a crazy idea, but I'm going to have a school and nobody will come. And I was wrong about that too. Now I'm quite convinced that in the time that is before us, I'm not sure that anybody will come, but now for different reasons. So I don't know what the future holds for this enterprise, but I know this, I set us the course of coming into blunt force contact with the unauthorized history of this fantasy and this dream and this waking vivid nightmare called America. That's what I set myself to do. And I did it, not completely, not to finish it, but I did it. And I'm just a guy. So if I can do it, it's doable, right? But you've got to act on your willingness not to criticize and condemn everything. That's not education. Education is the willingness um, to engage deeply unwelcome things about what you know. And I would call that a moral responsibility of anyone whose mind is still working. Laura has a question, and I think this will be our last audience question, if that's okay with you, Stephen. Okay. Reading the chapters on elderhood in a generation's worth, I found myself weeping at the bereftness of your take on the near absence of elders and eldering in this place, North America and time now. Learning the grief that is merited by this devastating absence is the only way I can think of to proceed now as a 63 year old. Are elders and elderhood a thing so far in our past that elders and elderhood are well and truly gone? Oh, they're gone. They're gone. But here's the, this is alchemical, finally. I don't know if this is good news, but it's, it's a news of a devastating kind. It comes from an old aphorism. They say, food makes hunger. How does that work? Well, if you've ever fasted, you know, eventually the absence of food does not produce food fantasies. There's some, some kind of metabolic mercy that ensues and you stop being hungry, you know? And it's obviously a mammalian adaptive strategy for contending with the with, uh, the, the unavailability of food and so on. Well, maybe this is a psychic fact too, or a spiritual fact, not just a, a gustatory fact. And if it is, then we could reasonably say that if there is a hunger for elderhood, a foot now so unlikely, so unrewarded typically, then it may confess something that we're willing to forego, that the hunger for elderhood is a consequence of the formless, for the moment, nascent presence of elderhood. 
as a, even as an absence, it has its presence. Longing, after all, is one of the most adamant human uh, activities. And the longing after elderhood sustained over a period of time produces the capacity for elderhood in those people willing to long after it. Now, isn't that a remarkable, unanticipated outcome? So if we labor after elderhood now, we're very unlikely to be in, deemed to be elders during the course of our lifetime. Because the course correction takes too long to, to appear, you see? But if you do your work and you leave the scent of the possibility behind, not that you were hopeful about elderhood, but that you actually were adamant on the subject, minus any supporting, sustaining proof that there was any upside to you doing so. Your example becomes the elder generating machine in the subsequent generation. See, you just don't get to live off the avails of what you tried to put into motion. And that secretly, that's elderhood in action. The willingness to forego the payday. So apropos of this question, let me read literally the last couple of, maybe the last paragraph. Of the, do we have another couple minutes? Are we okay? For sure, for sure. All right. So you're saying it's my show now? All yours. All yours. Very <laughs> good. Okay. I'd like to read this uh, in acknowledgement of the last question and the lady's age who asked it and this country and a few other things. It's virtually the last thing I wrote in the book, except, uh, aside from the forward, and I wrote it on the March the 20th of this year. Here is my PS on the matter of elderhood while the crisis reigns. There is a cloud of merciless unknowing that is rising now. The isolation forced upon the human world over the last year has clarified things egregiously, and we are truly living out the unmeant consequences of our choices. The crisis has collapsed the old order of self-determination. So, there is a regime of mental distress coming. It will gather and it will manifest after the all-clear signal is given when we're told it's safe enough to come out to play. Now, a few years ago, the Canadian government decided that the time had come for formally acknowledging the presence of Indigenous survivors of residential school in our midst. See, this was in the air before it was in the news. See, and I caught it. In this matter, recognition meant confession, in fact, required it. As part of the public display of acknowledgement, there was a public display of government culpability in the matter, entirely becoming. There was a companion announcement that a fund had been established to recompense the survivors and their families for the lost childhoods and for the carnage. And all the survivors needed to do was formally apply for their pay. Now, the rest of the story that I'd like to tell relies on anecdotal stories that I've heard. I may overstate the breadth of the consequence that came next, but here's what happened. With official recognition and with the government's mea culpa and with the grief grant all now out in the open, there was an alarming spike in the rate of suicide among the aging survivors of residential school. Now what they endured in those schools, only they know, they and those of their tormentors who are left. The consequences for their ability to live a family life, only they and their families know. But how then to understand that after a life of all of that, the last straw was the apology and the payday. How is it 
that the long-awaited vindication of personal pain amounted to the unendurable and the unlivable in a way that the pain itself never did. Well, something like that awaits us now when the powers that be tell us that it's better now, that we can go back to normal, many of us won't. Many of us won't be able to. Many of us will have lost track of normal. We'll mistrust what normal will do to our memories of acute isolation and the beggaring of self-determination. Many of us will have seen things in ourselves or our close kin, or our friends that we will not be able to look away from, that will be at least as bad as the confinement was. And we won't believe what it's done to how we see things and what we seem capable of. Or worse, the rest of the parade will go on as if the whole thing was no big deal. The elders, those of them left, will need to show us over and over what deepened by diminishment really looks like. They will be the frontline workers of the armistice, the essential workers of the all clear. Shall I try to sum up everything? Please, if you can. Oh, oh no, I can't. <laughs> but, uh, but let me fail with some, you know, finesse. I mean, that's a hell of a way to end uh, an encounter like this, most people would say. Aren't you supposed to end on an upbeat? Well, you mean a lie, you mean? Well, no, it's not a lie. It's just looking on the bright side. The bright side of what? Well, you know, this will come to an end. No, it won't. There's no sign whatsoever that the dominant culture of North America is willing to end. None. Okay. And we are its children. We are its keepers. And we are its practitioners and its beneficiaries, as well as its victims. So what is the responsibility that descends upon us in a time such as this? such that generations not born today will find a way to claim their heredity and their, their union with us over the span of the generations that ensue between now and then. Well, however we proceed, we'll answer that question. And I'm just reminded I'm, I'm, this is my way of thanking everybody for tuning in and for asking the questions and for Banyan doing what they're doing. And amen, support the local bookstore, please. And enough already with the Amazon thing. But what I'd like to mention is a little piece of news I heard some time ago. And maybe I got the whole thing wrong. But apparently, there was a in Iceland very recently, maybe during the course of this year, there was a glacier that was fast receding. This is not science fiction. It's not even fiction. It's barely science. And apparently, people in the know, perhaps it was a government, I don't know who it was, they put a plaque at the foot of this receding glacier. And apparently, the plaque in Icelandic said three things, which poorly translated, perhaps, were these. We know what's happening. We know what must be done. Only you will know if we did it. And I just wonder, who's the you that the plaque is referring to? Is it, is it a plaque directed to the young? Well, it's very possible, maybe even likely. But I'm an animist. I can't help it. And so I'm thinking that a fellow animist was behind the plaque somehow. And the you in the third item is the glacier. Only you, the glacier, will know if we did 
what we knew we had to do. It doesn't matter if we're negative or positive about the likelihoods. It doesn't matter if we're pessimistic, optimistic, narcissistic, or anything in between. What matters is if we're willing to live and behave as if what's happening is happening. That's the measure, not our feeling tone while we're doing so. So that's my plea. Understand yourselves to be citizens, natural born of a troubled time. You could consider that affliction or you could consider it assignment. You know what I'm advocating. Thanks for listening.